all the kids. It's like they're not here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church out here on the prairie. Good to see you, my friends. Um, my name is Justin. This is Kim. We're going to sing some songs, get our hearts and minds in the right place as we begin. Let's stand and sing together. Uh, feel free to grab chairs as you come in, too, and set them up and do your thing. Sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. So gladly sustain it. Hast thou not seen how thy desires have been granted in what he ordained? Sing praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend. Surely his goodness and mercy are daily ascending. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he be friendly. One more time, praise to the Lord. Sing praise to the Lord, oh let all that is in me adore Him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again, gladly for I be adore Him. Let the Amen sound from His people pray with me this morning, friends. God, thank you for each precious person that's gathered here today. Thank you so much for the sun rising yet another day and for another chance to know one another, know you, God, as a part of us, uh, and know this wonderful world that you've created. Um, I ask for each one that's coming that they would know your love in some special, unique, and similar way, God, and pray that each of us would love one another well today we ask in christ's name and all of god's kids agreed and said amen amen and amen well um again we're so glad you're here with us uh, we're going to pass the peace we're still trying to do it in a contactless way but if it's your own family you can kiss each other that's okay but turn to one another and say the peace of christ be with you and oh oh yes and the kids come forward while we do that kids come forward to this giant blue dot by miss alex Hello, kids. It's good to see you today. Can you show me your big muscles? I feel like you're all pretty strong. Show me your muscles. <laughs> you are all so strong. And you're not just strong physically. Your brains are strong, too. You're smart, and you're brave, and you're capable. And I'm sure you hear all the time how important it is that you stay healthy and strong, but it's also important to stay strong in your faith. Jesus gives us a whole new kind of strength. Do you see this picture? Yes. This is how we think of armor. Did you know 
I have armor on right now. Can you see it? What? You can't see it? Okay, well, what about this kind of armor here? Does someone want some sunglasses? No, I do. I Put some sunglasses on. Does someone want a helmet? Yeah, <laughs> Does someone want a jacket? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get... <laughs> So you all, that's kind of like armor. How is that armor? Yeah, that helmet protects your head. Oh, I do have glasses on. That's a good point. And your sun, the sunglasses protect you from the sun being in your eyes, and the jacket protects you when it's cold. But I have armor on, even though you can't see it. All of us have armor on every day. It is the armor of God. We have our faith to strengthen us. Sometimes life is hard and we might not feel so strong. We might feel weak or discouraged or unsure about things. But we can pray to ask God for strength and power. And the challenge that we're facing might not change, but we can gain the strength to face it. We'll talk about it. (laughs) And imagine how comforting it will feel to know that we are blessed, that God is with us and his grace is enough for us. And as you grow in your faith, your relationship with God will change the more you learn, the more you experience. But just remember that you are walking through every day with the armor of God on you. And we are all here to remind you of that and help you in your faith journey. Let's pray before we go back to Sunday school. Loving God, give us the knowledge that Jesus gives us strength. Be our armor in times of weakness. Let us feel your love and power. Amen. So let's sing over these guys as they head back to Children's Church. A blessing over them. Child of joy, our dearest treasure. God you are, from God you came, back to God we humbly give you, live as one who bears Christ's name. Good morning, beautiful people of God. I am Patty. I'm the pastor here at First United Methodist Church Prairie Campus. I'm so glad you're here. You matter to me, you matter to the people around you, and most importantly, you matter to God. I want to welcome any first-time visitors we might have here at the Prairie Campus. We like to say we especially welcome those of you who are single, married, divorced, widowed, partnered, straight, LGBTQ, black, brown, white, filthy rich, dirt poor, doing okay or in desperate need of a prayer today. However you walked into this space, you can belong here. You're loved here. If you are a first-time visitor, I'd love to take you out to coffee, get to know you better. If you'd be interested in that, there's a green welcome table over there where you can leave your information and where we have a free gift for you. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online, whatever day of the week it is. We're so glad that, that you're joining in for worship. It's also my joy to welcome up here Don Hoffer, who's going to be our Sunday liturgist today. This is that part of the service where someone from the congregation comes up, shares a favorite reading with us, and then leads us in the prayers of the people. In the prayers of the people, there's a part for you when Don says, God, in your mercy, we're invited to say, hear our prayer. And then we end with the Lord's Prayer. We're going to try something different today as well. There's a prayer of confession that's always part of the prayers of the people. And today we're going to say that in in unison. So at that part of the prayer, when Don invites you to, to join in that prayer of confession, it will be up here on the screen. All right, well, Don, come on up and let me tell you all about, uh, let me tell the congregation all about Don. Don was born and raised on a peach plum and nectarine farm in the Central Valley of California. He has his bachelor's in music and master's in choral conducting. He has three children. His youngest daughter is studying violin at Oberlin in Ohio. 
His middle son is married and has a granddaughter who's three and a half. His oldest is married, lives in California, and is going to be having a grandson due November 19th. Don also has six stepkids ranging from 16 to 26. He's currently a senior enrollment counselor for CCU's online adult degree programs as well as an online instructor. He has served in church music ministry, taught high school choir, sang in a southern gospel quartet, met Quincy Jones, wrote and recorded music, performed at the Hollywood Bowl, performed the national anthem for the Cleveland Browns, and loves Dr. Pepper Zero Cream Soda. <laughs> He's been attending Prairie Campus since July with Tracy Geyser. Don says there's nothing good in him but Jesus. Welcome, Don. You can move that and move over. I'm just going to pull it out since I have to move this anyway. And uh, first of all, I just want to say, isn't this a great place to worship? There, there is such a sense of freedom here that I have never felt in worship before, and uh, Patty's the greatest. So, um, October 23rd, 2021, began an unexpected chapter in my life, a chapter of grief and a pivotal moment in my journey for growth. The marriage that I thought was healthy began to unravel before my eyes like slow, drawn-out torture. I came to understand how blind I had been to what real love is and how I needed to change to be the man God called me to be. As I came through the valley of the shadow of death, I came into green pastures near still waters. I had a renewed hope. Here is where that hope came from. In Matthew 5.13, you'll see this very long passage on the screen. Jesus tells us, you are the salt of the earth. You probably know salt has been used as a preservative even back in Jesus' day. I propose to you that Jesus' mission in coming to earth, besides paying the price for our sin, and conquering death for all time. Jesus' mission was related to salt. To salt. Jesus came to preserve something. But what is it that he came to preserve? From infancy in the conservative American evangelical church, I was taught to think that he came to preserve morality. I was taught that his mission was to tell people how to live their life, to preserve good, upright, moral, conservative, Republican behavior. The more I reflected on these ideas, the more I have now come to believe that Jesus did not come to preserve morality. I believe Jesus came to preserve something far greater. Jesus came to preserve the worth of every human being. The worth of every human being. Every person is created in the image of God. Every person has within themselves intrinsic and extrinsic worth based on that. Jesus helped people understand and feel their worth and gave them hope. It was the preservation of their God-given worth that gave people and gives people and gives me hope. And that's what renewed me in 2022. One of the best examples from the Gospels is this. And I believe Patty talked about this a little bit just a couple weeks ago. Jesus had the opportunity to preserve morality with the woman who was caught in adultery. He had the opportunity to point out to her the errors of moral demise and to tell her to live within the strict moral guidelines. Yet instead, what did he do? 
He preserved her worth by telling her, neither do I condemn you. Finally, Jesus verified our worth by paying the infinite price, giving his life. That is the reason for hope. So Jesus is calling us to be worth preservers. He's not calling us to preserve morality. He calls us to look at the people in our sphere of influence, in our world, and ask ourselves, what can I say and do? How can I live in such a way to preserve the worth of those I come in contact with every day? You are worth it. Before we pray the prayers of confession, would you just close your eyes and focus on Jesus with me? Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I've proved you o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust you more. Let me lead you in the prayers of the people. Loving God, my creator and sustainer, thank you for your son, Jesus, who came not only to offer us forgiveness, but came to show us our worth. We pause to give you praise and bathe in the cascading worth that flows from Jesus. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Now for the prayer of confession, and we're going to ask that you pray it out loud with me together, from your heart, with your voice. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. We have done things we should not have done, and we have neglected to do those things we should have done. Forgive us and turn us around, we pray. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious and forgiving God, we are thankful that we don't walk this journey alone but you bring us those to love and comfort us as well as those we can love and comfort. Help us to preserve the worth of all people with whom we come in contact. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, Lord, hear our silent prayers as we lift our hearts to you. Now, friends, let's pray together the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Don, thank you so much for reminding us of our worth in, in God's heart and eyes. 
Friends, I want to share a few um, announcements with me, but please take your bulletin home and, and find your place in this church, how you can serve and belong and, and grow. We have two groups coming up this week. We have a new men's group. We've had the, the Prairie Padres, which is, you know, the dad's group, um, but we're starting a new group called Prairie Guys, and they're going to meet for the first time next Sunday, and this is for any man in the congregation who is 18 on up to 100 or, or whatever. So next Sunday after church, please um, put that on your schedule and, and uh, join that new fellowship group. Also, the Prairie Madres is meeting um, at the end of this week, uh, so that's a, a mom's group, so please take note of that. Then lastly, we are bringing back the samosas and non-sales. Um, some of you know our, one of our families from Afghanistan is trying to raise a little extra money. And so um, that family is going to be selling samosas and non-bread. And you can see in your bulletin about that. I think you have to reserve it with Kim by Wednesday. And her email is in the bulletin. Now let us stand and continue to worship in song. Don, you need to get up here and sing. Amen. Woo! Don't pull that kind of thing and then just sit down. Come on. Right? <laughs> Let's sing together, friends. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, to lay my head, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so goodness of God. And I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. Known you as my mother, I made my home in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made. goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of your goodness, my God. Amen. You may be seated.
So this week we are launching a new sermon series. It's called Rescuing Revelation. Now I wonder about your reaction to hearing that I'm going to be preaching on Revelation. A lot of people don't like this book of the Bible. In fact, noted preacher Barbara Brown Taylor writes, full disclosure, I do not like the book of Revelation. I do not like its violence, its vindictiveness, its psychotic visions, its attitude toward women, its enemy thinking. I do not even like people who like the book of Revelation. (laughs) Since so many of them use it to justify their crazier ideas about God, and scare other people with what they think they know. Right this minute, someone is turning turning a hurricane into a predictor of apocalypse and using the book of Revelation to do so. I wish it had been left out of the Bible, as it almost was. A lot of people don't like the book of Revelation. Maybe you are one of them. I get that. For many years, I just ignored this book. This is actually the first time I have ever preached on the book of Revelation. But maybe as we dive into the book of Revelation over the next few weeks, maybe it can be rescued a little bit for you. And you can find deep meaning and hope in this book. So my goal in today's first sermon, it's going to kind of serve as an introduction to this sermon series, and I'm going to hopefully reframe what we think this book is about and how to interpret it. Today I'm going to give you some tools to understand it. So before we hear our scripture verse, verses for today, I want you to take a deep breath again and feel your feet on the ground. Just open your spirit to how God is going to speak to you and touch you today. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1, 9 through 20. This book is the record of the events that Jesus Christ revealed. God gave him this revelation in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Christ made these things known to his servant John by sending his angel to him. I am John, your brother, and as a follower of Jesus, I am your partner in patiently enduring the suffering that comes to those who belong to his kingdom. I was put on the island of Patmos because I had proclaimed God's word and the truth that Jesus revealed. On the Lord's day, the Spirit took control of me, and I heard a loud voice that sounded like a trumpet speaking behind me. It said, write down what you see and send the book to the churches in seven cities, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see who was talking to me, and I saw seven gold lampstands. And among them, there was what looked like a human being, wearing a robe that reached to his feet and a gold band around his chest. His hair was white as wool or as snow, and his eight eyes blazed like fire. His feet shone like brass that had been refined and polished, and his voice sounded like a roaring waterfall. He held seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. His face was as bright as the midday sun. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now I am alive forever and ever. I have authority over death and the world of the dead. Write then the things you see, both the things that are now and the things that will happen afterward. 
Here's the secret meaning of the seven stars that you see in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Holy Spirit, show up and do what only you can do. Amen. When most people think about the book of Revelation, they think about the end of the world. Now, when you think about the end of the world, what what comes to your mind? Well, I want to show you a really brief video of what comes to mind for a lot of people. For people who ascribe to this Christian, apocalyptic, doomsday kind of theology. Let's watch. You awake now? (laughs) When I was growing up, that's how I imagined the final judgment. When I was growing up in my fundamentalist youth group, there was a phrase we used to whisper to one another. And this was the phrase, are you rapture ready? The rapture, familiar with that concept? The rapture is the belief that at the, at the end of the times that, that Christians will be sucked up to heaven before God comes and judges the world. One minute a person is sitting there, and the next minute they're flying up to air. I remember back when I was 12 years old, I had gone to a sleepover at my friend's house. She also went to my same church. We were in Sunday school together. We were 12 years old at the time. And I remember we were lying in our sleeping bags on the floor. And we were not talking about our crushes at that time or other typical middle school things that that girls might talk about. We were talking about the apocalypse, about the end of times. Now, we were familiar, you know, with with all the kind of apocalyptic language. We were steeped in the scenarios of all hell breaking loose and the Antichrist and, and the number 666 and wars and famine. And we we knew that it wasn't a matter of if the apocalypse would come, but when. And we figured it was gonna be before the end of the school year. Now, not long after I'd had this sleepover, there was one day when when I came home and there was nobody in the house. My siblings weren't there, my mom wasn't there, my dad wasn't there, and there was no note. And I started, you know, walking from room to room, you know, calling out names, trying to see, you know, and, and this panic started rising in me. You know, I was afraid that the rapture had come And I had been left behind. 
But just when my panic was kind of, you know, reaching its peak, the phone rang. It was my mom explaining where everybody was. And I was able to breathe again. Looking back, I can see how this doomsday apocalyptic thinking really hurt my developing psyche, how it hurt my growing faith, how it hurt my understanding of a, of a good God that I could love and trust. Maybe some of you also grew up in a kind of more fear-based religion, and maybe you know what I'm talking about. Are any of you familiar with the Left Behind series or movies? Yes? Okay, okay, a number of you. The Left Behind series, they tell the story of the end times in a contemporary era. And they draw, in, in the novels, they draw on images in Revelation. In the books, you know, the believers, the true believers have been raptured, leaving the world shattered for those left behind. In this book, you know, you read about the Antichrist demanding loyalty, about having to accept the mark of the beast upon one's bodies. But what really stands out to me in these novels is their portrayal of a violent Jesus. Jesus is is pictured up on this white horse as our hero, slaughtering millions. Here's an excerpt from a 60 Minutes interview with the authors of the Left Behind series. It's a segment entitled, The Greatest Story Ever Sold. It aired in 2004. In it, the interviewer, Morley Safer, says, the Left Behind novels give a graphic version of the return of an avenging Jesus, slaughtering non-believers by the millions. It's an image of Jesus that many evangelicals say is long overdue. Left Behind author Tim LaHaye responds to this comment, this violent Jesus, this judgmental Jesus, that stuff is straight from the Bible. The idea of Jesus slaying the enemy with the sword that comes from his mouth and the fact that the enemy's eyes melt in their heads, their tongues disintegrate, their flesh drops off, that's out of the Revelation prophecy. You know what my biggest problem is with the Left Behind series? The Jesus that I fell in love with in the Gospels is left behind. A faithful interpretation of the book of Revelation is left behind. The authors of the Left Behind series and some other doomsday end time Christians, they approach the book of Revelation like it's a crystal ball that they can, they can peer into that will tell them exactly how the end times are going to happen. They get all tied up seeing current events as signs that the rapture is near, that the end is near. But I want to rescue Revelation from that flawed crystal ball reading of it. So, how should we read it? First, we must understand its literary genre. It is a type of apocalyptic literature. Now, this kind of literature was popular about 200 years before the life of Christ on earth and about 200 years following his death. So, the original hearers, they were very... Um, familiar with this type of literature. Apocalyptic literature makes use of these powerful visual images that are designed to move the listener to deep emotions and change. It's symbolic, and it's, it's designed to make its point through images too powerful to ignore. 
When I think of apocalyptic literature, I think of the works of Pablo Picasso, whose art was a bit strange to some because there was not a straightforward kind of drawing. Consider Picasso's great work of art, Guernica, which he painted shortly after the Nazis invaded Spain. During the invasion, the city of Guernica was destroyed. Many of its people were slaughtered. The painting Guernica was Picasso's impression of what happened. It's not a literal picture of the event. Indeed, some of these images, they don't make much sense. Still, they tell the story of horror and cruelty in a way that a photograph of Guernica simply could not. People asked Picasso what the images in the painting meant, and he said, I don't know what it means. It means this is how I was feeling. And these images capture the horror that I was seeing. But still, people would ask him, you know, if, if one image or another represented something in particular. They would say, what, what is the horse represent? Or what is, what is that bull? Or that, that eye at the top? What does that represent? Trying to extract literal meaning from the painting. But Picasso said, stop analyzing it in a literal way and let the images create something in your heart. Many people are in love with literalness. But here's the thing. Sometimes you can communicate something in a non-literal way more powerfully than you could in a literal way. Here in this painting, Picasso is trying to impact our hearts. In many ways, this is how the book of Revelation was intended. Its images are meant to evoke emotions and wash over you. But they're not meant to have literal meanings. Revelation needs to be felt, not dissected. It needs to be experienced so it can create a change in you. Second thing. In order to understand the book of Revelation, we need to keep in mind that it was a letter written to actual people at an actual time for an actual purpose. It was written to seven churches that are in now what we call Turkey. Do you remember in our reading this morning the reference to, to Jesus standing amidst the seven golden lampstands? Remember that? Those seven lampstands represent these seven historical churches. So keep in mind these seven churches as we read the book of Revelation this month. Revelation's original purpose was to communicate to them. And so our job during this series is to get into their mindset, to understand the writings as they would have, and to access the symbols as they would have. Here's something important to get. If this book is about current events happening today, it wouldn't have meant much to the original people reading it. The idea that John of Patmos, the author of Revelation, really intended his message to be understood only by a 21st century Christian audience seems arrogant on our part. John is not pretending to write to them, but really writing to us. Now, these seven historical churches were made up of Christians who were experiencing persecution from the Roman Empire. And as we'll see over the coming weeks, John's message to them in Revelation was to hold on to hope 
in these hard times and to resist assimilation into the corrupt ways of the Roman Empire. John is, is smuggling notes out from the island of Patmos to these churches, using this biblical language and symbolism that the Roman oppressors would not have easily understood. It's kind of like passing notes under the authorities' noses to be able to safely get your message across without getting caught. For example, this week I watched this whole National, Ge National Geographic special about how the number 666 was actually a code for King Nero, something that the original audience would have understood. So first, in figuring out Revelation, we have to figure out what it meant to the original audience. Now, God can still speak to us through this book. And I trust God is going to still speak to us through this book. But first, we have to figure out what it meant to them before we can figure out what it means to us. Finally, I want to say one more important thing about our attitude as we approach this book. We are told throughout the whole Bible to trust God. Over and over again, the Bible says, do not be afraid. It's one of the central themes of the Bible, to trust God with your life and with your future. To rest in trust. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not worry about tomorrow. Look at the lilies of the field, the birds of the air. God takes care of them. Do not worry about tomorrow. In these words, Jesus encourages us to experience something like a carefree attitude about the future, to live in this, this inner freedom, knowing that we can trust God with our lives. Instead of getting all anxious about the end times, trying to figure out when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, the Bible tells us, just rest in trust of God. Our job as disciples is not to figure out the future, our job as disciples is to live faithfully right now. In the here and now. I close with a story from Rick Azell. He tells about a professor who had been invited to speak at a military base. Well, he, he flies in, and a soldier has been assigned to, to pick him up at the airport and bring him back to the military base. And the soldier that's been assigned to pick him up is a man named Ralph. Well, Ralph picks him up at the, at the airport, and they introduce each other, you know, themselves to each other, and they start making their way to the baggage claim. But as they're walking through the airport, the soldier, Ralph, he keeps disappearing. You know, he'll like run over here because he sees this elderly woman whose suitcase has fallen open, so he goes to help her. And then, you know, a few minutes later, he runs over to help. There's, there's this mother with this unruly toddler, and she's trying to run to the restroom for a moment, so he watches the toddler. And then the next moment, there's somebody who's like trying to figure out directions for something, so he goes over and, and helps this man. Well, the professor... Uh, notices that each time Ralph comes back with this huge smile on his face and the professor says to him, where did you learn to do that? Ralph says, what? The professor says, to be so kind and considerate in every moment. And Ralph says, well, I guess in the war. And he goes on to explain that during his tour of duty, his job was to dismantle landmines. And he saw over and over again some of his colleagues, some of his fellow soldiers who were working with him in the landmines, get blown up right in front of him. 
So Ralph said, I learned to live in between my steps. Because I knew each time I picked my foot up before I put it back down on the ground, anything might happen. And so I learned to get as much out of those moments in between steps as I could. I learned that each moment is an unrepeatable gift. I learned to live in between the steps. Friends, live in between the steps of your life. Live now, right now. Love now. Don't worry about the end times. Every moment right now is an unrepeatable gift. Will you pray with me? Oh God, help us to rest in deep trust of you. We don't know what the future will hold. We don't know what the end times are going to look like, but we know that we can trust you with our lives. And help us to live now, every moment right now, focused on being your disciple and your love in the world. Amen. Ushers, I believe now we're going to take our offering. So if you can oh, come yes. forward and we sing this song. Thank you. And take our offering. Be
people of God, life's greatest feast is here before us. We remember on that last night before Jesus was deserted, abandoned, and crucified, he gathered with his friends. As he gathers with his friends here, he took the bread, he gave thanks for it, he broke it, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, Remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins for you and for all people. Take and drink, and as you do, remember me. And so we remember him who always remembers us. Together, let's bless this bread and this cup. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and juice. Let them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, liberated by his witness, passion, and life. Be with us, Holy Spirit. Fill us so you can move through us. Amen. The table's ready. I'd like to invite the communion servers forward. If you desire gluten-free elements, those will be over at the, at the black table on the side. To access the juice, you just tear off um, the top of the cup. There's trash cans in the back where you can dispose of your cup. If you would like prayers for anything going on in your life or the world, Lynn and I would be so honored to pray with you. Lynn will be over here. I'll be here. And, and again, please come forward for any personal prayers you want. But most importantly, this is not our table. This is God's table. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, you are welcome here at the table. Every one of you is welcome at this table. Come.
friends, let's join together in the prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you, God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ, the living bread from heaven. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and let us show forth your light in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We please stand now for the benediction. For those of you who are physically able to, to put your chair up on the rack after the service, that would be so helpful to us. And now receive this benediction. God be within you to keep you. God be before you to lead you. God be beside you to love you. God be under you to ground you. And God be above you to bless you. Amen.